came out. To, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> the stage is yours. Okay. So welcome everyone. I'm Ethan Rati, and I'm a Python core developer, and uh, I've been working on uh, C Python for two years now. And uh, uh, I'm also a student in this university. I live here in Finland. I've been living here like four or five years now. And I'm studying here and also sometimes with also a teacher. I, I made like a Python course a couple of years ago. And I couldn't do it last year, but maybe this year I'll do again. And I also presented a number of posts, like a few different conferences, like Euro Pythons and Python E. And uh, today we will try to understand something about encodings and Unicode. How many of you are familiar with Unicode and encoding? Okay, yeah. it's good. I hope the thing that I will say today, uh, like something new that you don't know. Okay, so we can start with, with this quote by Joel Sporsky. Do you know who is Joel Sporsky? He's like the guy behind uh, Stack Overflow, the website. And he's also like, he was one of the main developers of uh, uh, Microsoft Excel. He used to work in Microsoft. And in 2003 he said, if you are a programmer working in 2003 and you don't know the basic of charters, character sets, encodings, and unicode, and they catch you, I'm going to punish you by making you pick onions for six months in a summary. I swear I will. <laughs> this is what he was saying in 2003. Now it's like 2011. So, like, eight years passed already. And now you really don't have any excuse to not know all these things. So if you don't want to end up in a submarine <laughs> feeling onions, you should better listen to what I'm going to say. Okay, we will start like trying to figure out what are like character sets and then uh, see what are encodings and how they work. And uh, once you know how these things work really, uh, you will be able to understand like some of the common problems that you see while working with Unicorn. Like, it should all make sense, hopefully, once you uh, start to understand what's going on behind the scenes. OK, and if you have questions, uh, you can stop me in any moment. But I will leave some time at the end for more questions, if you have. OK, let's start with a character set. The definition says that a character set is a collection of elements used to represent text on information. So we have like some elements, like letters, numbers, symbols, and other things. And if we put them in a set and we decide, OK, we take this group of letters and numbers and symbols and whatever, and this is like a character set. Most of the character sets don't just like put all the elements that are in a set. We also assign some number to each of these elements. And uh, these are technically called like coded character sets, where coded means that we get a number. But actually, you can just say character set, and uh, uh, it, like everyone understand because most of the character sets <coughs> are like coded. So it means that all these character sets we have like a set of elements, and each element has a number assigned to it. For example, ASCII. You all know ASCII. It's like maybe the first character set. It's like really old. It's like from the 60s, like 50 years old. And uh, you can see there are like here is the numbers and like an hexadecimal. And uh, these are like the elements that you see here. There are like a few control codes <coughs> and then some letters and numbers and symbols. OK, ASCII is limited to 128 characters. It only uses 7 bits, so 2 to the power of 7, and not 256, as someone thinks. So only 158 chars. That includes the 26 letters of the English alphabet, <coughs> so these ones, the digits from 0 to 9, and a few symbols, plus some other control characters. Uh, when they start developing ASCII, uh, I think they were still using like punch cards, and uh, at that time 
the bike wasn't even defined to be 8 bit, we had like different kind of bikes with different sides. So we decided to just use 7 bits. After a while, like the standard became uh, most of the bits, uh, most of the bikes were using 8 bits. And we started using like the 8 bit to, uh, like, for having like parity checking, so parity like error controls. And this was like still at the time of these punch cards. And uh, eventually we start realizing that, okay, what about all the accented letters? For example, here you probably use this character a lot. And uh, okay, it's not in ASCII. So what do you do? Then like this idea, <coughs> okay, okay, now bytes use 8 bits, ASCII is only 7 bits. So why don't we use the 8 bits to get more characters? So here is ASCII, and we say, okay, let's make this ISO 8859 one, also known as Latin one. And uh, let's add more characters with some accent. And that's what we did. We started introducing this uh, character set that uses 8 bits, so a whole byte. And uh, with 8 bits, it's like 2 to the power of 8, it's like 256 characters, so twice as much. And we start filling these characters with like accented letters and more symbols. But okay, some accents are still missing. And what about other alphabets? It's not just like Latin text. So we say, okay, that's not a problem. Let's make another chart set with Russian. But okay, what about Arabic? Let's make another one with Arabic. But they start like making all these different character sets, like the ISO 8859 family. And we start putting like for each of these like some different characters in the last 128 uh, places. But this wasn't really working well. But if I want to mix Russian and Arabic, they are on two different charts, so I can't use them together. And what if I want to use Inuktitu, that is like this weird language that is used like in some north of Canada by the Aboriginal people there. You can see like this. An example of a stop sign with some written in Inuktitu. Okay, this wasn't going to work. We needed a better solution. So we need something that had all these things, <coughs> and that's Unicode. And it doesn't just include all these characters that we find in uh, the ISO 59 family, but it also had like plenty more. So now we have only a single character set that replaces all the other 8-bit character sets and include like like covers all the characters from all the writing system of the world, modern and ancient. So you can really find like from uh, even Egyptian hieroglyphs uh, or uh, plain Latin text or Japanese, Chinese uh, or whatever you can think of is probably there. And uh, uh, being a, a coded character set, uh, you have like all these characters and everyone has a specific number. And this number is independent from the platform, the program, and the language. This Unicode and actually all the character set are like quite abstract. Uh, they're just like some definition of characters and numbers. We will see later how you actually use them. And all these numbers that identify all these characters are called code points. And Unicode provides over one million different characters. Uh, they are not all used, but this is like the available space. So we went from 128 to 256 to 1 million. So that's like many orders of <coughs> many, magnitude more. And this code points goes from 0 to 10 f f f f in hexadecimal. And this is the notation used to represent code points. It's like u plus and then the number in hexadecimal. And we say that, yeah, Unicode replaces hundreds of existing character set. You won't need to use uh, any uh, ISO 8859 
touch that anymore if you move to Unicode. Okay, we say something about code points. Code points is simply an integer and in this range, and it's expressed with the u plus and then the hexadecimal value. And for example, the a is like as this code point, and this other a is as this other code point. And each Unicode character not only has a code point. For example, do you know the Snowman character? They are quite popular uh, character in Unicode. So like this Snowman. It's like a code point that is like 2603 in hexadecimal always. And they also have a name, for example, Snowman. They also have a category, so symbol other. There are like other categories like letter, lowercase, letter, uppercase, numbers, symbols, uh, and several others. And then uh, a block, for example, miscellaneous symbols. The block identifies where, like, for example, Latin one or uh, uh, runic or uh, Egyptian. It identifies like the family of the script. And then it also defines uh, there are also like other attributes but we are not going to see. And uh, Unicode is organized in what we call planes. Uh, we have uh, the first plane that was, like initially there was only this plane called the basic multilingual plane that uh, takes the code point from 0 to F, 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 F. So 65,000 uh, different characters. And uh, this uh, BMT covers uh, most of the commonly used characters. So uh, unless you want like really fancy or weird characters, uh, you probably can find all the characters you're, you're looking for in here. But <coughs> then uh, they decided that it wasn't enough. We needed some more characters. And uh, at some point they extended Unicode to have uh, up to 16 planes. And they use like plane one for the, is like the supplementary multilingual plane. And the plane two is like supplementary in ideographic plane. And plane two from three to 13 are like still unassigned. It means that in future they might start using it for some other writing system or from other language. And uh, there are like some uh, special purpose plane. And then the private user area. This is meant for, uh, for example, some companies that uh, need their own special charters. Think about Apple, that they have like their Apple logo and uh, weird uh, icons. Uh, this is like, we can put it in this private use area. And uh, this are like reserved code points. Uh, the Unicode standard uh, won't assign anything there. So like companies can use for their own purpose. Okay, and uh, uh, these uh, planes are like divided in two main groups, uh, like the basic multilingual plane called BMP and the supplementary planes called non-BMP. Uh, this is actually an important distinction. Yes, question? Which uh, plane is Klingon in? Klingon? <laughs> yeah. Klingon is actually not part of Unicode. Yeah. Oh. No. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, there was actually a draft proposing for, uh, that was proposing the inclusion of Klingon. But it was rejected. Uh, at some point, it might get accepted. But snowman, no Klingon. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, the snowman was like part of some other uh, character set, uh, so they included it for compatibility. But uh, uh, there are actually some fonts uh, that use this private use area uh, to uh, use like uh, we use it for Klingon. So we just say, okay, Unicode doesn't want Klingon in it, at least not yet. Okay, we take one range of the private use area and we put like, we say, okay, we use this one for Klingon in the meanwhile. So you can find Klingon there in some fonts. Okay? Okay, so you see that uh, we start with ASCII and when we get like the Latin one supplement, so uh, it's actually Unicode, it's like uh, it assigns the same numbers to the uh, charters uh, that were in ASCII and Latin 1 or in DOI 891. But then it, it adds like much more till then F, 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 F. And uh, if 
if I were to show like 50, uh, 512 characters for each slice, I will need like over 2,000 slides to represent them all. And if I was going to show you like one slide per second, uh, it would take pretty much the time that I have left, some 35 minutes to show them all. So it's like really a lot of characters. And uh, since uh, I can just like show four of them, but like some guy <laughs> did it. Uh, he decided like to print a poster with all the Unicode characters on it. Uh, he, he actually wanted to make some small poster. It turned out that it's, you, you can't make it small. And this is like the result. It's like some huge thing with all the uh, Unicode characters. So you see like that you get an idea. I, I think that's asking maybe covers this corner here. And maybe here you have like uh, Latin one. And here you have everything else. And also, uh, Unicode has been around some 20 years now. And uh, uh, when Joel Sporsky was writing, it was still here. It, wasn't, it was like slowly catching up, but it was catching up. And uh, this was like from 2008, so three years ago. And you see that it's like becoming the most popular uh, character set. And all theaters are like getting less popular because Unicode is replacing them. And now we are like 2011, we keep following this trend. It like by now probably surpassed this by around distance. Okay, so do you have any questions about character sets? <coughs> or is it up clear? Question there. Is there many fonts that support all the characters? Uh, there are actually like fonts that support all the characters. I think there are like really a few of them, maybe less than 10 or 5. Uh, usually uh, there are like fonts that cover most of it or anyway like the uh, characters that are commonly used or even like less common but <coughs> maybe just like the really exotic one are missing. And uh, some application also have like some mechanism where if they don't find the character in one font they can start searching in other fonts and that's why sometimes when you have like some uh, we have character in the text, maybe it looks like different because uh, they took it from some other font, sometimes it happens. And what is a bit better than getting like some box. But uh, usually uh, there are like anyway fonts that you can install to get like a complete coverage. Any other questions? What about right to left and such difficult things? Yeah, actually uh, Unicode uh, is not just a character set, it, it doesn't just define like all the characters and gives a number to them. It, the, it also defines like a whole lot of other things. Uh, some of them are like quite complicated. For example, you mentioned left and right, because you know that some writing system they write right from the right to the left and not the other way around. And Unicode defines all these things as well, also like case mapping. For example, how do you take uh, a like a word or a sentence and make it uppercase or title case. There are like uh, many different rules. Uh, you know that one that you probably know. Mm -hmm. You know this character here is like uh, uh, S in uh, German. Then when it's uppercase it looks like this. When it's lowercase it's like two uh, S like this. So there are like all these weird rules and Unicode is actually covers all this stuff as well. So it's actually quite a big and comprehensive project with a lot of things in it. But we are not going to look at all this technical stuff, but Unicode takes care of all this. Any other question? Okay, so we can move on with the encoding. Okay, we said that we have like this nice set with all the characters in where uh, each character with a number. Uh, what do we do with like in concrete with this thing? We need an encoding. So it's like a mapping from a character set definition to the bit sequences used to represent the, the data. Because eventually we want to save this data on the disk or on some file or send it to the network or do something with this data. And how do you save it on the disk? You need to put it in some bytes. And same with the, when you send them on the network. 
So you actually need some way to convert this abstract characters and number to some well-defined sequence of bits and bytes. And for example, we can say that this character A uh, is represented by this bit sequence. This is actually in ASCII. We use this bit sequence to represent the A. And the next decimal is like 0x61. And the uppercase A is like some different bit sequence. And some uh, different hexadecimal value. These are actually the same values, and these are like the same values. One expressed in binary, the other in hexadecimal. Okay, then how do we move from uh, Unicode to uh, some sequence of bits? There are like two processes. There are like one is called encoding, and the other is called decoding. Encoding is when you have some character set, for example, Unicode and you encode in a, a sequence of bits. Uh, this means in uh, Python terms, you know that there are like normal strings and unicode strings, or in Python 3 we have like strings and bytes. And uh, when you move from unicode to a uh, plain byte, byte strings, you have to encode. So this is called encoding. The opposite process, when you get some bytes uh, you read it from the network or you open a file in binary <coughs> mode and you want to get the text out of it, you decode. So encoding allows us to move from text to bytes and decoding allows us to move from bytes to text. Is it clear? Okay, and there are like different kinds of encoding. Like the simple type of encoding is like called single byte encodings. It means that we only use one byte and we can represent all the, the characters in the character set using only one byte. The, like some other characters, for example Unicode, they can fit in one byte. We need several bytes. So we have like multi-byte encodings and these multi-byte encodings are further divided into other categories. There are fixed width encodings and variable width encodings. What does it mean? Question? Uh, yeah, in fact, the previous slide, actually, I don't understand what this encoding and decoding means. It's because, like, uh, once again, okay, you have some byte representation of the text uh, yes. on the network, for example, and then you decode it. Yes. And it, it will be still stored in the memory in some encoding. Yeah. Yes. Uh, internally, you eventually you always have some bits and bytes, but uh, uh, from the Python point of view, you have like a, a unicode stream uh, that uh, uh, is like independent from the bit definition. For example, uh, you know, you have like big endian and uh, small endian CPU, and uh, um, for example, they represent the bits in a different order, but all this is transparent uh, from like to you to the Python level when you're working with unicode. Because you have like a unicode string that is going to be always the same and you have like no limits and it's like abstract, you can do whatever you want with it. And when you encode it back, you will get to some encoding. And uh, uh, this works, but like behind the scenes, uh, uh, actually Python is using uh, an encoding. We will see later what is happening. But yeah, uh, like when you work with Python, you just need to know that you have unicode strings and byte strings and you convert from one to the other uh, using encoding and decoding. Okay. Okay, I was saying about the multi-byte encodings. There are like fixed width and variable width. This simple means that if you have a fixed uh, width, it means for example you say, okay, I will need four bytes and I will use four bytes for every character. Every character will have four bytes. Variable width is saying that Okay, we can use one byte for some characters, two bytes for some other, three, four for some other. So depending on the character, uh, you use uh, uh, a different number of uh, bytes. So this is not really difficult. And we will see a few examples. For example, all the eight bits uh, single byte encoding that we saw, like the uh, ISO family, uh, like Latin one or even ASCII, they <coughs> all need one byte because with one byte you can have like 256 possible characters so 
156 values. And uh, um, this is like actually cause of confusions because have you ever seen this in HTML? It says like uh, like that meta tag, like you sometimes find in the beginning of HTML pages. And here it says just set you get a and say but wait you get a is a just set it's not a just set. So why is called just set? Because uh, when there were around only one uh, byte encoding, uh, they didn't need any like fancy algorithm to convert to bytes. They had 256 characters. In one byte, you can put 256 uh, different bit combinations. So like the mapping was like forward. Mm -hmm. Like you get the first uh, bit combination, the first character, and so on. And uh, at that time, like the terms encoding and character set were like this, they had the same meaning. So that's why it's like confusing. Because uh, if I ask you, is uh, this one a touch set or an encoding? Well, it's both because it just assigns a number to each character, and that number is like directly converted to a uh, sequence of bits. So in this case, all these single byte uh, encoding uh, were both encoding and character sets. But like the distinction is not like always so confused. We will see that with Unicode, like we are two different things. Unicode uses these uh, encodings that are called UTF, but it means Unicode Transformation Format. And there are three of them, like UTF-8, UTF-16, and UTF-32. And uh, all these encodings are able to cover the whole Unicode character set. It means that you can take any of the one million characters and encoding it with one of, of these encodings. But we are like different. We are all multi-byte character encodings because clearly you can put one million different values in one byte. But uh, UTF-8 uses one, two, three, or four bytes. So it's like a variable with encoding. UTF-16 uses two or four bytes, so it's still variable width. And then we have UTF-32 that takes always four bytes, so it's like fixed width. And uh, uh, usually you want to use UTF-8, is what like most data are now encoding into. Like everything you see, hopefully, is like UTF-8. If you go on some website, hopefully it uses UTF-8. If you save some file with your favorite editor, UTF-8. These slides are saved in UTF-8, and that's why I can represent all the characters that you saw so far. And uh, uh, for example, it was like XML by default uses UTF-8. And uh, so it's like, if you do not encoding, assume UTF-8. Actually, if you do not encoding, uh, you're screwed, because it can be everything. But uh, if you really don't know, Oh, that is UTF-8. But okay, let's start seeing this encoding one by one, starting from the last. Okay, UTF-32. This is actually the easier of the encoding because each code point is encoded with four bytes. This means that it's not very memory efficient because, for example, let's take the A. It's like this is the code point. It's like 0061 next to decimal. If we look at the bytes used to represent the A, it's like 0, 0, 0, and 61. So it's actually using only one byte, and the other three bytes are just like filled with 0, so it's not very memory efficient. But on the other end, since it's fixed width, it's like only four, like always four bytes, it's easier, for example, to do the indexing and slicing. For example, if I have uh, a string that is like 100 bytes, how many characters will be in there? Well, it's easy, 25. Because if you know that the characters take 4 bytes, you just divide and you know. If you have a variable with encoding, you can't answer that unless you go check each character one by one to see how long it is. So, one of the main advantages <coughs> is that uh, you can like navigate the string easily. For example, if you want uh, 10 characters, you go to the 30 byte 
because you do like four bytes per chart, ten characters, forty. So it's like really easy to work with. But on the other end, it's not really memory efficient because, for example, for this case, it takes like a lot of space for nothing, for zeros. And uh, um, also you see that it, it, like the conversion is quite straightforward. For example, here is like the code point is 61, and there is 61. Here is E4, and here is E4 as well. Here is 2603, 2603, and even here like 1F029, 1F029. So it's like the conversion happens like directly. There's no like complicated conversion in between. UTF-16 is similar, but it tries to be like a little more efficient, so it only uses two bytes. So here is the same thing. You have like 61, and uh, it's like 00 and 61. E4 is like 0, 0, 4. 26 of 3 is like 26 of 3. Okay, but what about this? You can put this in two bytes. And uh, uh, remember that at the beginning I said that the distinction between BMP characters and non-BMP characters is like important. That's why it's important. Because uh, as long as you stay in the BMP, so in the first 65,000 uh, code points, so till F, 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 then you're fine because you can fit everything in, in two bytes. When you go over it, this doesn't work anymore. Uh, actually, I think that when uh, UTF-16 was introduced, uh, Unicode was still supposed to just be 65,000 uh, code points, so it was working well. But when they decided that they weren't enough and they had to use like one million code points, they needed a workaround to like find a way to encode this one in UTF-16. The workaround they uh, Found. It's called like surrogates or surrogate pairs. How many of you have ever learned this surrogate or surrogate pairs? Okay, two, three. Okay, this is like if you go, for example, in the Python bug tracker or in many other applications, it's not just Python that is broken, and you search for surrogates, you will find plenty of bugs because this is something that like made UTF 16 complicated. Because it was first a uh, fixed with encoding with only two bytes. And now it's like two bytes for most of the charter and the BMP, but sometimes four bytes, and let's break a lot of things. Okay, but the workaround makes some more sense. It is not difficult to understand. Basically, they say, okay, instead of taking uh, only one byte, we take two, like a pair of bytes from a special range that is just used for this purpose. So this one alone doesn't mean anything. It's actually invalid in art. Like, it is not like you can do anything with it. Uh, it's just used like to be combined with this one. And from the combination of these two, you can get to this one. And uh, like this uh, code points in this uh, surrogate range are like invalid in UTF-8 and UTF-32. And uh, so we can <coughs> be encoded and decoded, and uh, are valid in UTF-16 only if they are like up, like paired correctly. There are two kinds of surrogates. There are high surrogates from this range, and uh, uh, low surrogate from this other range. So you take an high surrogate, a low surrogate, you put them together, and you get a non-BMP character. So a character with a code point higher than F, 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 F. and. Uh, if you get the order on the other way around, it's invalid. If you get a single, a long surrogate is called, like a single surrogate is invalid, even in UTF-16. And any code point in these two ranges is always invalid in UTF-8 and UTF-32. This is another thing that breaks. Because uh, uh, try to pass a surrogate to some function that, like, for example, put a surrogate, log surrogate in an XML file. Your application can decode the file anymore because it's not valid UTF-8 anymore. So they cause a lot of troubles. And uh, um, so some people, when they have like, a problem, they say, OK, let's pretend they don't exist. It was easier before. Let's pretend that nothing changed. And let's keep thinking of UTF-16 that it was like, only two bytes. Uh, 
Okay, you can do that, but when you, for example, when you calculate the length of the string, you can use the same trick. You have like 100 bytes, let's say, okay, let's just divide by 200, and that is like 50 characters, and that's not count, that's not okay. And same while indexing as slicing, and uh, some say that 65,000 code points are anyway enough for everyone. You don't need the uh, authoring like non BMP uh, code points. Uh, this is actually something that even Python does or at least used to do. And uh, we will see later like, some implication of things. <laughs> but anyway, many things break due to like, like surrogates or like accounts of many records around. Okay, finally, we see UTF-8, like the coolest encoding ever, or the most popular one. So we will spend a bit more about it. Okay, UTF-8 is like a variable with multi-byte encoding. So it uses many bytes, like more than one <coughs> byte to encode the code points. And uh, it's like variable width, so it means that it can use one to four bytes. This makes it like memory efficient because uh, for example, for the letter A, we saw that in UTF-32, you have like 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 61. Here you just have the 61. You don't waste space on the uh, useless 0. And uh, for ASCII, it uses only one byte. And this means a really important thing, that UTF-8 is compatible with ASCII. If you get uh, an ASCII file and you decode it with UTF-8, the result is going to work. because. Uh, uh, UTF-8 and ASCII are compatible. This doesn't mean that uh, ASCII is compatible with UTF-8 because UTF-8 of course can encode all the uh, Unicode characters. ASCII is limited to the first 128. But the other way around works that everything that is valid ASCII is also valid UTF-8. So it uses only one byte. Uh, for BMP characters, it uses two or three bytes, depending on characters. And uh, finally, for the non-BMP characters, it uses four bytes. Uh, since it is like a variable with encoding, uh, it needs some way to uh, figure out how long the sequence is going to be, because uh, it needs a way to say, OK, this thing is long two bytes. This other is like four bytes. This is just one. And how does it do it? It uses two kind of bytes. First is like a start byte, and then is followed by zero to three continuation byte. So the start byte specifies how many continuation bytes there will be. So you start reading IUTF-8 string, you get the first byte, and this is a start byte. And you look inside and see, OK, this is telling me that it's like a three byte sequence. So you read the two bytes after it, and this up two bytes will be two continuation bytes. And then you combine the three bytes together, and you can get a code point out of it. And how do you say that? OK, there will be three uh, bytes next. OK, this is like the bit pattern. OK, here I'm going like kind of low level, but it's actually like quite easy once you get it. If we start with 0, it's ASCII, because uh, since it like ASCII uses only seven bytes, it means that eight, like the eight bit means like only seven bit. So the eight bit is always zero for ASCII. So if the first bit here is zero, we have an ASCII byte. If it, the first two are like one and zero, it's like a continuation byte. So one that follow a start byte. Then you have like start bytes of two, three, and four byte sequences. And these are like 110, 1111011110. And it's like easy to remember because if you see two ones, then you will get two continuation bytes. If you see three ones, you will get three continuation bytes. And if you actually not, it's like if you see two, it's like a two byte sequence, so only one continuation byte. If you see three, it's like a three byte sequence, so one star byte and two continuation bytes. If you see four, it's like a four byte sequence, so one start byte and three continuation bytes. And the zero here, you can think that it's like some kind of separator. And we can see an example. So if you have the sequence E2 98 
a3. Uh, you look at a2, and you see that it starts with 1, 1, 1, 0. So, 1, 1, 1, we have 3, 1. It means that there is a sequence of 3 bytes. So, here I already divided it, it's like 1, 2, and 3 bytes. So, if this is the start byte, it means that this 2 should be continuation byte. Continuation byte starts with 1, 0, so this is a valid continuation byte, and this is 1, 0, another valid continuation byte. <coughs> so, this is good. So, since uh, uh, UTF-8 uses this extra bit uh, for uh, its information to figure out the length and what kind of part it is, uh, the re remaining part is like stored in these other bits. So you get 8 bits from here, 6 in this byte and other 2 here, and then other 8 from 4 from here and 4 from here. So once you figure out that this is a, a 3 byte sequence, this is the start byte, this is the continuation byte, you just get rid of this thing because we don't care. So we just delete it. And we end up with all these x and y bits that are like the parts that uh, are interesting. So we just combine them. So we take this part here with the other x here, and we put it here. And then we take the y here and here, and we put it here. And then we convert this to hexadecimal, this to hexadecimal, and we get 2603. And u plus 26 of it is our nomen. So you see, this is how the uh, decoding works. The encoding is the same thing the other way around. But uh, with this, you can get an idea of how it get it works. And uh, another advantage of this uh, uh, pattern is that uh, if, for example, you start reading a string from the middle for some reason, you can uh, move uh, back and forth until you find the start byte, and then uh, take the start byte and keep reading normally from there. So you can start in any point of a UTF page string and figure out where the characters are. So it's not that if you miss the first byte, then you won't be able to understand any of the other bytes. Maybe you will just miss one character, but from the next character on, you will be able to uh, decode it. And uh, the fact that some bits uh, are also used to identify continuation bytes. It means that in case of errors, for example, some interference in the network, a byte gets dropped or one bit gets split or whatever, it might happen or some disk failure. Uh, if this happens, uh, you, uh, for example, assume that we drop this byte here. Here it says three bytes. This is gone. We find only this one say, okay, we were expecting three bytes, we only have two, there's something wrong. So, you need for, uh, I mean, you get eight, is able to figure out that there's some error. So let's see, like, a couple of examples. For example, the lowercase a uh, is like an ASCII character, so only one byte needed. This other a is not ASCII anymore, and uh, here we need two bytes. So this two here. Both the snowman is like a BMP character, so it's like in the BMP range. We need three. Actually, even this one is like BMP character. So like from like in the BMP range is like either two or three. And if we get over in the non-BMP character, we will need four bytes always. And this, by the way, is like the Mayong tile for winter. Have you ever played Mayong? Like some popular game, okay. And uh, even the Mayong tiles are in New Report for some reason. There are some <laughs> the domino tiles and playing cars. But, okay. So how much time do I have left? Okay, so now that we got an idea of how encoding works, I will give you like a few recommendations on how to like use it in practice. The single most important recommendation that I can give you is like decode early, always work with Unicode, and encode late. 
It means that when you are reading data, for example, from a file or from the network, you don't keep it as byte. You decode it to Unicode <laughs> as soon as possible, and uh, you make sure that you always have everywhere Unicode in uh, your application. With Unicode, I mean in Python, Unicode strings. You do all the text processing. You never do it on bytes, because on bytes doesn't work. If you slice a byte, you are going to get uh, uh, a few random values. For example, if I try to slice this thing as a byte string, and I want the first two characters, and I slice this, uh, I get the first two bytes that is like half characters. So this is not going to work. But if I do it on this one, that is a unicorn string, then it's going to work. And once you are done with all your text processing, and you have like some result that you can actually save on the disk, send on the network, or put it somewhere, then you can encode again, uh, possibly in UTF-8, and keep moving on. Uh, also, this means that uh, uh, if, for example, you open a file that is saved in uh, Latin 1, and uh, you get some data from the network that is UTF-8, they're incompatible. But once you decode it, you, are, uh, you have like unicode strings, and they are compatible, so they work well. But you have to decode first. So decode early, work on with unicode only, and then code late. Then, as I said already, always use UTF-8 for your data. Never mix text and byte. So don't mix unicode strings and byte strings, because uh, bad things are going to happen. And never mix encodings. And as long as you work unicode strings, you can't mix encodings, because encodings are, are not there. Encodings is, is something that only the bytes have. And never do test processing on bytes. And always not encoding, because if you are not encoding, uh, you're out of luck. And uh, uh, OK, have you ever seen like errors like this? Like, <laughs> yeah, like some people say, oh god, unicode error. What happened? I have no idea. I don't, I don't even want to read this thing because I don't understand. It's like something obscure and complicated. Well, it's not so difficult. There are, first of all, two types of Unicode errors. There are Unicode encode error and Unicode decode error. And from this alone, you can already get an idea of what's going on. I mean, was it decoding or encoding? And uh, encode error is like during encoding, and the code error is during the coding clearly. So for example, if I get this unicode string here, like the Python three syntax, so I don't need to put the u in front. So it's just a unicode string. And I try to encode it in ASCII. Uh, of course, ASCII doesn't have these characters here. So it gives me an error, and it says, ASCII code can encode character, uh, this one, in position three. Actually, position three is like this one, zero, one, two, three. Because the ordinal is not in range 128, that is like the ASCII range. And uh, uh, another error, like I can encode it in uh, uh, Latin 1, that works because this is Latin 1, but when I decode it, it explodes because uh, I encoded it in Latin 1, and then I'm trying to decode it in UTF 8, that is another encoding. So it gives a unicode decode error. Okay, we don't have much time left, so one. And uh, on Python 2, you can actually mix Unicode and Byte, but that works as long as you have ASCII and ASCII. Or uh, actually, here you can even have non ASCII, but this needs to be ASCII. Because what happens when you mix Unicode and Bytes? Python decodes automatically the Bytes and makes them Unicode. But while doing so, it uses the default encoding that is ASCII. So if I get uh, a Unicode string, and uh, a byte string that contains non ASCII, it tries to decode this thing to ASCII, and that doesn't work. So you get an Unicode decode error, because it was trying to decode this. And <coughs> the ASCII code is failed, because by default, Python 2 uses ASCII. And uh, you get an error. On Python 3, this doesn't even happen, because you can mix bytes and text anymore. We figure out that we are like two different things, and you can mix it. Question? Uh, yeah, I uh, read uh, somewhere a recommendation that uh, it um, would be useful to set the uh, default encoding of Python 2 installation to UTF-8. Uh, actually, there are like a number of places where you can set the encoding. One of these places is like this one. Uh, you can define the 
Python source code encoding with this comment on the top of the file. But uh, uh, this doesn't solve your uh, Unicode problems magically. This actually doesn't affect uh, what kind of encodings your pro program will be able to enter. This only says that this uh, source code, so the text file where the source code is saved, is like is saved in UTF-8 because it contains like some uh, Unicode characters. And uh, so you need this one to define the source, but this doesn't do anything more. And uh, um, basically, you have to do all the encoding and decoding. You always have not encoding and do it yourself. For example, when you open files, and uh, you always specify the encoding, and it's like always better to be explicit about it. Yeah, right? actually, what I was asking there is you, uh, sh uh, there was, you did show this uh, get default and oh, yeah. function. There is this corresponding set default and calling function. And so some people are you say that you using that. Actually, uh, we like the set default encoding function, but that is only used internally, and you, you can't call it from your code, so you can't uh, change the default encoding. And, uh, um, but it, like, the right solution to this problem is like to use Unicode literals here. So uh, don't uh, rely on some default encoding. It's like use Unicode wherever possible, and if you have like some bytes, uh, like, if for example, if you open a file where you, you will say, like, what is the encoding to use, you won't rely on this one. So it's like not, I mean, it, you can even say you get eight, but in some places it's going to break if it's not always you get eight or there might be problems. So it's always better to be explicit. Okay? Okay, so I think we have that much more. Sure. Yeah, actually, but like the last thing, this is actually. Not always crazy to Python, but have you ever seen this kind of thing? Especially like in the browsers from when they get emails. And have you ever wondered like, how the hell did it turn out like this? I mean, what happened? Uh, it's actually easy to explain now that we know uh, how encoding works. Okay, yeah, this is like, the, this is called Moji Bucket, I don't know how to read it. It's like some, some text that got messed up and it became like, um, Comprehensible or whatever is the word. But, okay, if you have UTF 8 and you know that this letter in UTF 8 takes two bytes, but for some reason your browser is showing uh, uh, ISO 8851 and that is a, a single byte encoding, you mean that you have two bytes here, but uh, that in one is showing them like as two separate bytes, so that's why you get one and two different chapters. If you do the other way around, so you uh, have some uh, string that is saved in 8851, so you only have one byte for this, and you show it as UTF-8, uh, you, you will get this chapter here, but it's like some character that UTF-8 uses is like a replacement chapter. When it can't uh, decode the text, it just replaces it with this. So it means that this, the byte that you will use it in uh, uh, Latin one to represent this character is not a valid byte in UTF-8. And another important distinction is that 8-bit encodings can encode the code everything. You will never get a the Unicode decode error with Latin one because uh, every single byte has a value. This is not true with UTF-8 and the other codes because different bytes, uh, I mean, we have to be like in the right combination. And the last two things. Uh, you probably, or maybe you know that there are two uh, Python builds. How many of you know, like, have ever heard of narrow and white Python builds? Okay, few person. Uh, this is actually uh, is something that it doesn't bother you until you get to use like some uh, non unity character. But what are the differences? That uh, internally, uh, the narrow build uses UTF-16. So this answers the question. That uh, got asked before. While the white build uses UTF32, this means that uh, here every character uses two bytes and the F4, and there's also this variable that max unicode is 65,000, and here is 1 million. So the white build is actually the best one because it covers all the range, but as I said, it uses more memory, which is memory, and this is, memo is more memory efficient, but when you go to the non-bitmap chart, you get some problems. 
For example, if I place the length of this single character, then you get to, because you're actually getting the length of the surrogate pair. And if you try slicing or indexing, like here it works fine, like this one character, you take the first character of a string of one character, you get the same thing. But here, you get the first of the two surrogates, so here it's not working too well. And uh, uh, this is actually finally solved in Python 3.3 that will be released at some point next year. But like this new test uh, with like Python announcement proposal. Uh, but, but like we are using some new way to represent Unicode internally. So this actually doesn't affect the user. Uh, except that uh, uh, we use like as many bytes as we need. So it's like more memory efficient. Uh, so it's like we change the representation depending on uh, the kind of characters that were are in the screen. And uh, use less memory. And it's still fast even if we have like different representation and we have to do some computation to figure out what is the best one. Because uh, we actually did some improvements and uh, um, like speed ups. But also because uh, since uh, we have to allocate less memory, allocate is actually something that is time consuming, but it's still fast. Uh, for you, uh, it doesn't change anything. It's like the behavior is like the same of a wide build. So everything was fine correctly, like it was like here. So everything is correct. Uh, and uh, like the C level, so if you're writing extension with like a new API, uh, is compatible with the old one. So even if you're <coughs> using the old one, everything was fine. But if you don't, uh, you should switch as soon as possible. And here's the link. And OK, it's done. And uh, this is like the, our snowman <laughs> friends. This is actually is not an image, it's like just a unicorn character that you see here. And uh, remember that if you don't learn unicorn, you will end up in a submarine killing onions. Okay, this is the end. Any question? Yeah. Yeah, that is like the uh, uh, called like the normalization form. Yeah. So you can get sometimes, uh, the, uh, for example, the yeah, like this one, like actually all these characters. Uh, you actually have a code point for this character here and one for this one. But you can also get it uh, taking like a plain ASCII E and uh, a combining accent, that is like two different code points. And when you put them together, uh, like the application, for example, the browser that renders the characters combines them. And these are like called normalization forms. So it's like different ways of like, expressing this. And uh, uh, usually it's always the best to use the single code point that represents the character. But sometimes you also get this combining accent. But then you can also normalize Unicode. Uh, there are like some algorithms that uh, uh, like, uh, tells you how to convert it into <coughs> original single code point, if possible. Because not all the single code point. Okay. So but we probably don't have time for yeah. questions. Uh, but we can ask for you for qualifying the encoding for us. <laughs> How we will continue now is that we will have a break that lasts uh, up to uh, 15 minutes over 3, so we have a 10 minute break, uh, then we will